What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. If you ever want to be inspired, this is the interview for you. If you ever thought something in your life is insurmountable to overcome, listen to what Christopher had to overcome. Listen to this interview in inspiredinsider.com. Christopher Ategeka, he even talks about how he didn't have shoes till the age of 17. That and much more coming up now. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today's story does not get more inspirational, and I'm really excited to have Christopher Ategeka. He was voted Forbes Top 30 Under 30 Social Entrepreneurs this year. Chris founded CABikes.org, which helps people in rural Uganda to receive critical health services. They're focused on critical health in rural areas by building and distributing locally made bicycles and bike ambulances to reduce maternal and child mortality. And we'll find out why that is so close to his heart. Um, We're gonna hear more about how and why he started the nonprofit CA Bikes while finishing his PhD in engineering at Berkeley and also while starting two for-profit businesses. Chris, thank you so much for taking the time. No, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And, you know, we're going to talk about how you overcome personal and business challenges because so many people talk about tough times. There's things standing in their way, personal issues, money, health. And the question is, how do we overcome what seems insurmountable? And you're the perfect person to talk about this. And I want to thank uh, Launch Towers founder, Alex Champagne, who they have a great design development company, but he reached out to me and said, you need to have Chris on. And so that's what made this happen today. Um, and Chris, I always like to include a fun fact about the guest. You have so many fun facts. I had to make <laughs> a laundry list, but a few, it, Chris, a fun fact about Chris is he wore his first pair of shoes when he was 17. Um, the first time he was on a flight was when he was 22 coming from the U coming to the U S from Uganda. And he can run a three minute, 58 second wow. mile on a treadmill. And he speaks nine languages. I don't even know where to start with that, but <laughs> let's talk yeah. about the the first pair of shoes. Yeah, or, um, yeah. It's you know most most people in let's say in this country find shoes as a you know it's a it's a thing that you have grown up with and and they never even ever think that you know biggest percentage of the kids all around the world you know having a pair of shoes is a luxury. Um, it's not an everyday thing that you get. So yeah. So when you were growing up, what were you just barefoot or what? Oh, bare feet. Yeah, it's a, it's a normal thing. It's not like I was, you know, out of the ordinary one right. guy walking bare feet and everyone else is not. It's it, in the places I grew up were in in Uganda, rural Uganda. It was just yeah. a normal thing. So. so describe the scene so we can kind of visualize. What is it like in rural Uganda? Um. So it's dirt roads. Um. And some places there's actually no you know, roads that are passable by a vehicle. Mostly it's like a path uh, and a bunch of bushes leaning into the, you know, the path. Uh, uh, no electricity, no running water, uh, and mostly thatched houses. Um, and, and that's the life. <laughs> so what was your, you know, the, the house you lived in? What did, what did it look like on the inside and the outside? So it was a mud house with uh, you know, dirt walls and no electricity, like I said, no running water. And every time you need uh, uh, water, you have to walk a few miles down the street to pick up the water using like a, an empty gallon, milk gallon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for electricity, we use kerosene lamps, you use kerosene, uh, and that's what we burn. And if you can't afford the kerosene, you use wood. Uh, so you go find dry wood and you burn that. Uh, so it's like a, a campfire. Um, that's your regular electricity. Yeah. So in this, in the Mata house, what was it like? How many people were were in that living with you? Um, it was about nine of us. Um, but also there were multiple houses uh, mm-hmm. because it was kind of an extended 
Um, so in Africa, the way things work is not like here in the U.S. where, uh, you know, when you're 18, you start thinking about where you're moving next. In older days, mostly extended families, uncle builds a house down the street and, you know, stays within proximity. So it's, it's a communal basis type of thing. So everyone kind of knows everybody in the whole village. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's how it works. So how many in your particular house, I know there's houses right next to you, but how many, uh, you know, brothers, sisters or family members did you actually physically live with? Uh, it was nine, like I said, but nine uh, in I, that same house, though. In that same house, right? And also, there's like you know, space for goats and. How and, big is this? <laughs> not big, <laughs> not big. People share beds, and uh, you know, the people share housing with livestock, so it's like a common thing. Um, and, and yeah, so it was. Uh, it was uh, me and uh, my four younger siblings and. Um, uh, few relatives. So tell me, what were you thinking when you put on your first pair of shoes? Um, it's weird. <laughs> Where were you? Uh, I was uh, I was going to my school, the first school that uh, um, the lady Kara Adams that we'll be talking about later. That in the U.S. though? No, in Uganda. Oh, I was in Uganda. Okay. Um, and so. Uh, tell us a little bit about what your childhood was like outside of the the housing, your your family dynamic. Well, it's uh, mostly um, you wake up every day and you think about what you're gonna eat that day. Um, what is typical? What's typical? A yeah, typical <laughs> meal. Typical meal we have like staples, you know, potatoes, bananas, and um, corn flour. People, you know, eat that. You know, some people call it ugali. Um, and you, you prepare that and that's what you eat. But most of the time, it's not readily available. So part of uh, excitement or the journey for the day is to actually be able to, to gather it or find it. So, yeah, you wake up, you go, you start thinking about that. And, you know, nothing more than that. Because if you have food, you know, life is good. <laughs> right. So, and so you had um, younger siblings, and one of them was the inspiration behind CA bikes. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So my 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 younger sibling was uh, you know when both of my parents passed, as culture has it, I was responsible for uh, my younger siblings because I was the older child. Um, but for the most part, it's. Um, for the most part, when, you know, as culture has it, you take care of your siblings, you know, other cultures, your uncles and aunties take care of the sibling of, of the children when their brother or sister dies. But the mm -hmm. problem with that is these families actually have their own large uh, families and children. So it's really complex to add on another being. Uh, so In so your case, there were five other beings, right? There four were five, me, so it's Four five. and you, right. But it's typical to find lots of childhood families. Yeah. In, you know, what I mean, what happened with your parents? Uh, they they passed. They died of HIV. Wow. And yeah. so after that happened, you have to take over. Yep. Yep. Uh, and you know, it was approximately you know seven or eight. It's not. Um, I I don't. I didn't know how old I was until later in life. But yeah. You were about seven or eight. Wow. Yep. And so what happened with? your brother um, that was an inspiration to the CA bikes, what we know now? Oh, he, you know, he passed on the way to the hospital. Uh, he couldn't make it to the hospital fast enough. And that was because we, in rural Africa, for the most part, there is no system for emergency transportation. Um, yeah. So if you're lucky, there's a loved one to carry you on your back, or there's a wheelbarrow close by. Uh, that's what you have as an option to go to the hospital. So think about if you have a pregnant uh, wife or sister who needs to get to the hospital, they can't get on your back. So you got to figure out a way how to get them there. Um, sometimes you find yeah. like four people carrying like a stretcher type of bed, mm -hmm. and you know, each calling on each corner and they carry a person to the hospital. But anyway, so my brother didn't have any of those alternatives. Then he had to fight 
quite a, some sort of illness that I have no idea to this day what happened. Uh, that was really taking him down hard. And so he never made it. So that's why I decided to start Sea Bikes to be able to help folks who are in need of emergency transportation in rural areas. Yeah. First of all, Chris, I'm so sorry to hear that. And that is just such a, a painful memory. So I appreciate you sharing it because it can't be easy to kind of relive it every time you you tell it but i know someone out there is going to get something you know out of this and it's going to inspire them so thank you thank you thank you um and with that so did you did that exist at the time these bike ambulances no they don't even exist today (laughs) i mean but you you created them i created them yeah Uh, like what gave you that idea then well, it's not like we started with ambulances. We um, we started with bicycles and wheelchairs. Uh, I never knew the difference between physically uh, disabled and mentally disabled. Um, so people who are, you know, physically disabled in my country and most African countries, they're really treated as second class citizens. They don't. They are like useless humans who have absolutely no contribution to society. So when I got my mechanical engineering background, I realized, and also part of this of my school at uh, UC Berkeley where I was going, there was professors with PhDs in wheelchairs, and I realized, like, oh my God, these people actually have brains. Um, so I wanted to help out with uh, wheelchairs for people who are literally stuck at home and that's all they know and um, get them mobile so that they can go to school go to hospital and be independent and have some freedom Um, so when we started there we realized there's a bigger need um, to to stress this a little farther because it was an iteration of multiple uh, uh, designs to get there yeah, and I want to talk about, because I know we skipped over a lot of stuff. I want to go back to kind of your journey to the U.S., but at what point, obviously that was the the root of the idea. At what point did you actually start CA Bikes, what we know uh, what it is now? Um, I, I It's easier to go through the journey to uh, where I came from, to America, and then back. Okay, <laughs> because so go ahead. Of- um, because there's I, a lot of missing pieces in the middle. It's hard sure. to follow their story. Yeah. So go ahead. Um, you know, starting from that after that happened, you um you ended up moving with your <clears throat> uncle, right? Oh, so I lived with my uncle for a while, um, and there's a lot of things that happened there. Uh, but time went on, and I ended up um, connecting to a nonprofit. Um, it's a nonprofit that helps kids who have been orphaned. Uh, by all these illnesses, and I was one of the orphans. And uh, the nonprofit is called YES Uganda. Um, and the lady who started it, her name is Kara Adams, and she's uh, coming here in like a month or two. I'm excited to see her. But she's uh, she's the one who started the program to help orphans uh, go to school, and once you finish high school, you learn a trade. So you either become a mechanic, a carpenter or a nurse, whatever you want to be. But the whole uh, theory of change is to be able to help people learn how to fish. Um, and for me, I was very lucky around that time. Part of the donors, one of the families that was donating through Care Adams to help all these orphans, she had like 500 orphans at the time, um, uh, decided they wanted to help an orphan go to college instead of just stopping at a trade. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, Kara had like literally swing a hat full of names and just pick out a name, and I happened to be the lucky one. Really? Uh, so yeah. it was random chance that you actually yeah, got chosen. Definitely. It was a random because it was definitely random because she had five hundred other names to choose from. <laughs> so it happened to be the oh, one. Wow. I was very very lucky. Um, but then since then, she has you know she had doctors, lawyers, and nurses and all kind of just name a profession she has someone yeah. there and she has helped many many people and we all yeah. forever be very grateful <laughs> yeah and the the reason we're talking is because of a story that you talked about um when you were with your uncle yes yes so what was that 
Oh, so when I lived at my uncle's place, um, you know, part of my job was to wake up and milk the cows. And once you milk the cows, you go to tend a field, a, a, a crop field. So my uncle was a farmer who had tons of crops, like, you know, corn and, and beans and bananas and all kinds of, uh, you know, he, he grew stuff on large scale. Um, and part of it is how there was a lot of uh, birds and animals that would bed the crops and just kind of destroy them. Um, so my job was to uh, go to the garden early in the morning and just throw rocks and, and, and all kind of make noise, whatever I, I got to do to scare the animals away. Uh, you do that every day, and that was my job. So, you know, someone, <laughs> we typed it as a human scarecrow, and uh, you know, a lot of people were, you know, inspired by the idea. Yeah. And you put this on Reddit, and how many people ended up coming to your site because of oh my your human scarecrow story? <laughs> it was crazy. We had about 200,000 people clicking through the site at the same time, and the site crashed. For two days, we stayed, you know, worked really hard to bring it back up. Even to this day, it's not fully functioning because all the, the images and, you know, the code that gets the image rolling is not working, but we're still working on that. But it was a very, very um, kind of good experience. Yeah. So following that, so you, you um, get picked out of a hat to go to college. What happens next? I end up um, going from my village to the airport. Um, but before that, I had to get a visa, which was very, very challenging. It's not easy to get paperwork to come to the United States. Um, but, you know, I applied for a visa. It took like a year of work. Um, I ended up getting it, which was not easy. And once I did, I ended up um, at the airport in Uganda. And when that happened, I got on a plane through Dubai and San Francisco. And what was that so, like? Because this is the first <laughs> time on a plane. First time to be on a plane, first time to see a plane. Um, but also it was very interesting because I came from the village and we have dirt roads. Um, and, you know, I was dirt brown from the travels uh, and I got on a plane with all these clean seats and these fancy machinery and, and like systems and computers or whatever you want to call it. Um, then it was a very interesting experience to see the other people in relation to me. <laughs> and um, when I got on a plane, uh, the attendant handed me a little white towel uh, and they were handing them to everyone, but for me, I didn't know what to do with it because I've never seen it. So as time went on, I just looked around and saw what everyone else was doing, and I, you know, cleaned my hands and my face, and it turned dirt brown itself. So, and I was so embarrassed that I, I just decided to keep it, so I never gave it back. Uh, but you know, I got on a plane. I was so fascinated by the idea because we flew from. Dubai to San Francisco for like 15 hours and I, you know, no touching the ground. I had so many questions. Why, where's the food coming from? Where, why, what's the fuel? Like, why is this thing not running out of fuel? All these questions was very fascinating. Um, and, you know, I was like, wow, maybe it's God just dropping food in the plane. Because <laughs> you're things. used to walking for water, you know, bringing it back, and now someone's just coming up and handing it to you? Handing it to you, yeah. Like, you, how awesome is that? <laughs> and not just someone, some beautiful women on, just on the plane. <laughs> yeah, but it was very fascinating. So what was it like then when you touched down? Um, I landed in San Francisco, and my now co-parents were waiting for me at the airport. They've been supporting me for about seven years. Never met, never talked to them. Uh, we've been email, uh, you know, kind of letter writing and trying to stay in touch. That way, they sent me pictures one, through Kara Adams, um, and now there I am in front of them. Came with a backpack, and that's all the belongings I had. <laughs> Uh, so, what do you say? Someone has literally changed your life. Yeah. What do you say? Uh, and they take and, you in, you're living with them. 
Is that me in? I lived with them for five years uh, while I was going to school, and I moved out and have uh, I got my own apartment. So tell me the first time that you walk in their house, because now obviously you can flip a switch in the faucet and the water comes out. You have yeah. obviously plumbing, you have electricity. What were you thinking then? Um, crazy. <laughs> just you, you're trying to ask someone to pinch you, and, and you just want to know whether this is like a really long dream that you're about to wake up from. It's scary. Um, you you know you are afraid maybe someone's going to take it away. Yeah. Uh, all these thoughts, but yeah. um, we got into the place and there was a bed ready for me and it's computers and never you know I don't even know what that is. Yeah. Uh, right. Microwaves, computers, and uh, refrigerators, cookers, and and my mom bless her heart she had to teach me these things like a two year old. <laughs> Right. Yeah, this is a microwave, and this is how you turn it on, and that's the switch. And you know, it was really, really incredible learning curve. Um, and she taught me how to drive. Um, and for the most part, she had to drive me everywhere. Um, and you were how old were you at this time? It was it 20, oh, yeah. 22. 22. <laughs> I'm 29 now, so yeah. I've been here for seven years. Yeah, so at the time, Chris. This it's surreal. It's amazing, but it's also scary. What were some of the scary parts? Because you knew nine languages at the time. Did you know English? I knew a little bit of English because I uh, volunteered at Karen's place, and Karen is an American. She came from Hawaii, mm -hmm. uh, so in order to communicate, you got to learn a little bit of English, but nowhere near any English you can use here for anything. Uh, I took a lot of classes at a community college, and. Um, Try to learn English, but that was scary. Uh, just communication. Most of the time, you're quiet because you don't know what to say, what's right, what's not right. Uh, all of a sudden, what may be right in your culture may not be right here. What was uh, what was one of those differences culturally that's okay there and not here, or here and not there? To call someone fat. <laughs> and <laughs> there is. Oh, over there, it's awesome because the more fat you are, the more well off you are. Right. Uh, yeah. So, and, and people just like, oh, if someone comes to you like here and say, oh my God, you lost so much weight. You look, you look great. And over there, it's like, oh my God, you gained weight. You look great. I got you. <laughs> so, yeah. So, like things like that. Yeah. Uh, even ordering food. Like, you know, you go to like a Mexican restaurant, for instance, and you want a burrito and they say okay what kind of rice do you want what kind of this what kind of that and like you have so many options you have no idea what to say it's like i don't know just give me a burrito <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's complicated it's hard to understand because for me i have like one choice where i come from you you're like you're gonna eat corn bam that's it but here you have you walk to a grocery store and you have like 20 types of apples and gazillion types of this, that, and the other. Right. So it's just so hard to make decisions. Yeah. Um, and so even just the choice, as great as it is, it, it is yeah. scary because you don't know what to ask for. Yeah. And uh, again, <laughs> when you come over here, it, it seems surreal, but was any part of you at this point, and you didn't want to take it away, guilty because you left all family members and people behind that weren't Let's able to get this? Let's talk about that. <laughs> um, yes, because um, part of it is also looking at the the trans, like the way money translates. Um, uh, my parents were really great. They've offered me anything that I need when I need it. Um, but when I do the conversion, I used to do like a mental conversion all the time. It's like, okay, I just got a shirt and it's hundred dollars in Uganda. That's, uh, that's 200,000 and 40, you know, but it's like, oh, I just got this. And it costs that. Oh my God, that's this much. Uh, and, and thinking how much that money can be shared with other people. Right. Right. I come from, but it took me a long time to get over it and realize like, okay, this is the new reality. Uh, just take it in. It's not, you know, it's it. You're not gonna solve the whole world problems. It's hard though, mentally. It is hard. It's tough. Yeah. And even the way people treat pets here, it's really, really interesting. And I know it's a very sensitive subject. 
for some folks, yeah. but um, it's just, it, it's different. It's really different. Like, you know, spend billions of dollars. Yeah, there's, you know, homeless people on the street. There's kids in foster care that could use a home and all yeah. that stuff. But I understand kind of like yeah. now that I've lived here, the reason why things yeah. work the way they do. It's just a totally yeah. different culture. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's their reality. And your reality, you're thinking, you buy this shirt for a dog, you could, you know, have this village with running water. Yeah, <laughs> that's the mindset. And it took me a while to get over and like... You don't yeah. have to get over it though, you know? And that's what, you know, there's no reason you have to. Well, it's if you come to some someone else's culture, you respect it. And, mm -hmm. and part of the respect is to be able to accept what's normal. Um, and, and, and that's one of the things that's normal. And if you don't like it, go back to where you came from. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you in someone and I don't agree with you because you know, you don't have to accept what's normal. And I think that that's why you're, you know, you're going to create change um, with what you do with the CA bikes. Um, but at this point, you're, at what point do you enter Berkeley? Um, I started at Community College, right? The, like the first week I got here, I went to school. Um, and one of the classes I took right, was programming. And I've never... Uh, you haven't yes. seen the computer at this point. <laughs> yes, yes. So you're learning programming and you actually learn that this is a keyboard, this yeah. is a screen, and this yeah, is yeah. all these things. So, and I actually got an A in the class yeah. at the end of the yeah. class. And that's like the proudest A I've ever gotten. I always look back to it. Um, no, for, you know, I started community college, did lots of math classes, lots of English classes, um, graduated highest yeah. honors. Uh, for my community college, and then I, I transferred and got accepted to many schools, and one of them was Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And uh, I transferred to Berkeley, I did my undergrad there, finished uh, my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. And you say this very nonchalant, Chris, but, but the bottom line <laughs> is people grow up very privileged, they study, they have tutors, and they still can't get into Berkeley, right? So that's pretty remarkable. Well, thank you. It's it's just the drive. Like, what is you know? What, what was the inspiring you? What was what was the drive? Okay, look at look at me. I came from nothing, like nowhere, and out of someone's generosity, I'm right now sitting here and talking to you, right? If someone has sacrificed, they have they don't know you. They you have no biological connection to you. They have other gazillion, brazilian ways that they could be spending their dollars. They have other people, even in this country, that they could be supporting to go to school. How lucky can you possibly be to throw that opportunity away, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So for me, what kept me going the most is the idea that someone is sacrificing their dollars. They've welcomed me in their home. They want me to succeed. And I should. Yeah. I should. I should not waste their dollars. Yeah. Who was the inspiration for you growing up? Um, so my inspiration was my grandma. And my grandma is deaf mute. She yeah. doesn't hear yeah. no talk, but um, she's yeah. one of the most inspiring, yeah. strong women you can possibly meet. She uh, yeah. invented her own sign language. Uh, wow. Me and her. Uh, the people who know it the most because no, um, yeah. she she literally raised me when my even before my parents passed away they had uh, separated um, and she's the one who took me in at nine months old and then you know breastfeed me at some point too uh so yeah she's she's uh, amazing she had to do lots of uh, uh, work in the fields and sell stuff on the street to make sure that I grow up and, and be someone. So, so how did she teach you her sign language or communicate when she was deaf mute? Um, it's just like we all learn by imitation. So as a child at nine months old, mom that you know, um, she has to communicate with you somehow and uh, you pick it up as time goes on but what's even more remarkable is the idea that i was able to talk <laughs> that's even more remarkable than learning the same language because um you know as the only language that i was raised around and um, imitated other people 
uh, other kids I was playing with and stuff like that. And, um, That's how you learn to talk. To learn how to talk, right? So, so you're at Berkeley. At what point? When does CA Bikes come about? Okay, so graduating at the, at Berkeley, I finished my bachelor's and graduated. Uh, I did really well in school, and I was a student speaker uh, for graduation. And they, um, so one of the um, awards for um, graduating seniors at Berkeley, it's called the Judith Lee Stronach Award. Uh, all seniors are welcome to apply, and they give four awards to, uh, you know, four deserving uh, students who are graduating, and they you write a proposal, you propose an idea, and they give you $25,000 to go run the idea for one year. Oh, wow. And uh, you come back, report, done, and you can continue on with your life. But for me, when I started, uh, this thing took a really huge spin of its own, and I could not just shut doors and, and, and keep going. I had to incorporate from a nonprofit and move and keep working on it. So you yeah. applied and you were one of the recipients. And so I was got, one of the four, right? And you got the $25,000 um, reward. reward. Yep. And so what did you do with the money? Uh, the money was to do prototypes. I did about 12 prototypes of different uh, two wheel vehicles to help and in developing countries, especially in Uganda, that's where I did all my prototyping and, um, and distributed. And there was a huge, huge need. Like that we had an, an influx of people who need the products compared to the amount of resources we have. So we had like, we kept a database of you know, who was next on the list. For people who um, don't know, Chris, just describe what that prototype looked like. Because I don't know if people can visualize, you know, what kind of vehicle, what does it look like? So I can, okay, let me describe the, the, the bike ambulance, how it looks like. So you go into the trash or throw them away pipes, whatever. You pick them up, you bring them into the garage, which is like my backyard. Um, and you uh, weld the pipes together uh, with some, you know, you can paint. You see, you paint the metal uh, to prevent the rusting and just, you know, to look good for the design. Um, and then there's a canopy, which is like a, a camping tent type of thing that you attach on top to prevent from rain, the raining or the sunshine. And then, you know, add tires to it and you attach to a bicycle and you have an ambulance. Uh, it has a little cushion inside that someone can just lie in and just ride. <laughs> so it's a bike and then attached to it is like a little... Like, it's like a baby it? puller, like these little yeah. pedicabs, but the yeah. one you can lie in. <laughs> Got it. So, yeah. Like, you know, people have seen pedicabs in like New York or mm -hmm, places mm -hmm. like that. So instead of sitting down, you're lying down. And that's basically the difference. So what was, so, and what was the hardest part early on? Um, the hardest part is just the demand exceeding like exponentially the amount of resources we yeah. have. And also this grant was a one-time grant. So yeah. you have people who have the momentum going, you've distributed the, the products you've created, and now what, right? I'm not an expert in fundraising. I have no idea how to go about getting more resources. Um, and do I shut the doors and turn off the lights and fire everyone and just move on? What do you do? Uh, it was really, really tough at that point. And, um, you know, how many bikes were you able to produce? Um, I think we were able to produce um, close to, I want to say, about 150 uh, at that point. Uh, but also we spent lots of the money on prototyping because there were different designs that didn't work out as intended. And so um, what does it equate to in helping people? Um, um, I'll, I can tell a story that yeah. just recently happened. Yeah. It's easier. Um, we distributed two ambulances at the border of uh, Uganda and South Sudan. And in this particular area, there's a, like, a little clinic that is primarily for mothers to go get their and give birth. They don't do anything else. They don't have those expertise and all the resources. Uh, we put two ambulances there. Within two weeks, we transported 20 seven mothers from their village to give 
Earth safely and transported them back with their babies to the village. So that's, you know, and this is a, an ambulance that's, you know, very, very cheap, easy to make, and anyone can make it. And the key element of our production is the idea that you make everything locally using local resources. So we don't want to import anything into the country because we want to be able to scale this, but also be able to help teach the local people how to make these products. They don't have to rely on us when we're gone. Right. Do you create jobs? You create, create jobs. you know, it's self-sustaining. And that's why you just don't go buy out, oh, we'll buy you a thousand bikes. Because then if something breaks, they won't know how to fix it. And you teach them how Absolutely. to fix it. And if they need more, you know, you're teaching them how to make more. And they don't have to depend on someone coming in, just dropping them and then leaving. Right on. That's right? it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for people, you know, also why this is so important is because it's not like here. What is the, um, is there a certain uh, infant death rate? So when you actually transport the pregnant women to this clinic, it's a huge deal. It's a huge deal because, uh, you know, think about here, if you, you know, people have insurance and people have like these fancy ambulances, you call 911 and they show up and then they don't have money. It's, it's legally required for them to show up. Uh, over there, they don't have any of that system in place. Um, you're either uh, giving birth at home and hoping for the best uh, with no any physician or nurse, anyone help you or um, one of your family members can try to help you get you to the clinic or the nearest clinic and the means to get there that's a whole other question <laughs> yeah yeah and so what was the next step or level you know the initial prototyping and then what was next how you actually because then you have to distribute it and teach the people there um, so the next step from there was uh, trying to find more resources. So I actually came back to the U.S. Um, and I started my master's program. Um, and, you know, I got into the master's Ph.D. program for Berkeley. And I started going to school, but I, at the same time, uh, pursuing trying to get more resources and uh, you know, talk about coincidence and luck or whatever you want to call it. I gave a talk at one of the uh, big signature events at UC Berkeley, which is like a charter gala, some sort of a gala that the school puts up. And there were all these uh, very high uh, influential people, you know, Secretary of Energy was there, CEO of Google and people like that. Um, they talked about my work. I was selected actually as a student speaker at this event um, and, you know, talked about my story, talked about my work and, you know, someone from the crowd from Chevron just stood up and wrote a check for twenty five thousand um, dollars right on the spot, and so that helped me um, hire people in Uganda to continue uh, moving forward with the work and putting kind of leadership system in place to make sure it continues without my you know physical presence there. Mm -hmm. But like I said, we created sustainably such that with or without me being there, it can continue. Because people know what to do. So you're here, they're there. How do you hire or put people in place? It's hard enough to put people in place where you are located, you know, if you're face to face, let alone, you know, US, Uganda. So it's tough. It's, it, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's easy. It's tough right. to find trusted people. Yeah. It's tough I mean, to find committed people. Um, but, you know, uh, at the end of the day, you know, you have to invest the time. There's, you know, a lot of messing up that happens along the way. Yeah. You know, the hiring, you know, the hiring slow, firing fast. <laughs> what did you do to find your, talent? Because obviously if you can do it in your U.S. hiring people in Uganda, someone in San Francisco hiring someone in San Francisco, it should uh, apply also. What did you do to find and actually hire good people? I, I, I don't know. I don't have like a magic coin that I just throw out there and people just uh, come and work with me. But I think for the most part, part of uh, the brand is my story mm -hmm. and people resonate to it and people want to be part of it. Um, a good example is uh, LinkedIn offered me to post positions for free, which is a, like a, a service they offer and you have to pay to use it. Um, I posted six positions and I got 
in all volunteer positions, mind you, and I got over 260 applicants. Wow. What was the position for? <laughs> Um, I needed a development person, I needed a social media, I needed a marketing person, and um, this goes on. But all these people just wanted to be yeah. part of the, um, the cause and what we were working on for free. And I was on the other side of the coin to just say, hey, um, you know, I, I think I'm not going to work with you. <laughs> you know, start to turn people it's tough, who yeah. just want to work for you for free. Right. <laughs> Really, really tough, but uh, you know, I found really great people and they have a, a very good team here in San Francisco that I work with. Yeah, so you put a team in place and you went over to Uganda, you put that system in place so it's sustainable. What else have you put in place that has helped get CA Bikes to where it is now? Uh, bookkeeping and transparency that's very key. Uh, so you have to have some sort of what's the bookkeeping system. Uh, some people use Excel, and some people use fancy softwares, uh, you know, but it's very, very key for the person who is giving you their dollars, that it be an investor or a donor, yeah. to be able to see that every penny you, they gave you can be accounted for. And, you know, and that's uh, very, very important when you're looking for extra money and say, look, this is what, how much I got and this is the list of where it went. I want your dollars and this is where it's going to go. Um, so those are kind of like two key elements. So what's been the toughest part at this point about growing CA bikes? Um, it's, you know, we're, we're still going through it. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's not easy to scale. Uh, uh, it, it, it's easy to prototype, show what you are uh, doing and, and, and kind of start working outwards. But the harder part is moving to other countries, different regulations, different rules, and uh, also finding people that have the same kind of passion and uh, bundle, uh, you know, work they want to, they're determined to see this move forward. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and also the funding element, just being able to find the dollars to say, okay, I, I build, you know, 300 of these in Uganda, I want to go to Kenya, I want to go to Rwanda, uh, you know, please give me money. Uh, it, it, as easy as it sounds, it's not easy to get the dollars. <laughs> uh, yeah. So how many locations do you have building the bikes in Uganda? Um, no, we only have one. We started in Fort Poro. We, we moved to Kampala, which is the capital city. Um, and that's been going on a while. We don't need, we didn't want to open another location yet uh, because we wanted to kind of like scale what we have right now. And uh, it's a central location that can distribute the entire country. So we don't have to do other locations. Uh, but as we move forward, we want to move on and do Kenya and Rwanda and South Sudan. Yeah, because I remember I watched your TED talk, TEDx talk that you gave, and yeah. you give some statistics of how many bikes and how many people you're able to service to get to the hospital. Yeah, yeah. Um, our little, uh, so we go for villages that yeah. end the way between 1,500 to 2,000 people. Uh, and you place an ambulance there. Um, each ambulance serves, you know, about you know, five, anywhere between three to five people a week. And in some cases, multiple uh, times a day, one ambulance has to go. Like these two just place somewhere and they carry 27 people in two weeks. Um, it, it's just very variant. It's very different in every location. Mm -hmm. And so... What are some of the things, other uh, common things? I, I know you noticed or mentioned the, the pregnant women transport. What else um, is it really specialized in or do you see? Oh, there's all kinds of things. Uh, there's, there's malaria, there's uh, HIV. HIV is another element. Lots of people are, you know, don't have access to um, what they call the ARVs, which are these pills people have to take every day in order to have a functional life. Uh, people don't have access to that. So when the immune system goes down, then they're literally helpless. Uh, yeah. So all kinds of illnesses, but as our focus, we focus on mostly, primarily the mother, uh, mothers and children. But, you know, an ambulance is available for everyone, anyone, yeah. you know, accident victims and just we can go on. So, Chris, 
I know that uh, you have lots of bikes there. How many people do you think you service per month total because of your vehicles? Um, so air, each, each ambulance goes um, five. So each ambulance supports at least, you know, 20, you know, about two, so five, about 20 people a week, right? 20, 20 people a month, sorry. And we have 150 ambulances out there that have been serving people. So if you got 150 times 20, um, yeah. just multiply by a year. <laughs> uh, and that's just the, the you know, the yeah. estimate. Yeah, that's pretty remarkable. What's, I mean, coming from everything you've said, what's been one of the proudest moments for you? Uh, proudest moment got to be my graduation, man. It's, it's, it's one of those things. Um, I stood on the podium giving a speech to, you know, 20, 30,000 people, yeah, uh, you know, considering where I came from to now, you know, in my graduation, there was, you know, a few thousand students who just graduated and um, this one random kid who's standing on the podium and talking to everyone and representing the class. And it, it was just one of those things you can never um, just explain in words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I know you've had a lot of help along the way, but you've had a lot of internal drive. Who are some of your mentors in your journey? Um, I mean, the, the, the family that I live with, um, they have been very helpful and supportive. Uh, Michael and Martha Helms are like the, my parents, uh, my American parents. They have two of their children. Um, but, you know, Michael always says that how comes the harder you work, uh, the luckier you get? And that kind of sticks to me all the time that, you know, if you keep working hard, luck will strike you here and there. Um, and my professors have been very, very supportive. I have a, um, a professor who, you know, I work for and do research for, um, writes all my recommendations and continue to uh, by him and uh, another professor at UC Berkeley. Yeah. His name is George Anwar, and he's very, very been very supportive. Uh, he says I inspire him, but I, I feel like he inspires me. So yeah, it's mutually beneficial. What entrepreneur founder do you look up to as a mentor, even though you don't know them, that maybe one day you want to meet? Um, I I think the guy who started Tesla. <laughs> Elon he's, Musk. Yes, he's he's such a genius. Like the way he thinks, the way he uh, like he's been able to start multiple companies at the same time and yeah. become very very successful. Um, it's just like trying to understand the drive and the way he does his thing is just uh, unbelievable. So. Yeah, just meeting him and kind of sharing a few words because we're kind of the same boat of uh, serial entrepreneurship. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd love to meet him someday. But, you know, so you never know. It's a small world. For sure. Anyone else that you have uh, that one day you're going to meet? Um, so that's one. Um, I, I, I don't know. The guy, the guy who started uh, uh, Facebook, yeah. he... He's a young man who, you know, started his company without any idea it's going to literally be one of the top, you know, highly valued companies in the world. And, you know, it just eventually just happened. <laughs> and uh, just uh, meeting him and having that conversation, and see how, you know, how he learned, how he felt, and all those things, you know, yeah. it's helpful. Yeah. And then, so I know you mentioned, Chris, one of the biggest roadblock challenges is, is funding. Yes. So what are some things that have worked and what things do you need to, you think you need to improve on to get more funding? A um, few things that have worked is like, you know, the story, uh, this, the people, lots of people resonate with this story. Um, and also, I'm not an expert in fundraising, so what we need to improve on is finding people who actually have that expertise. Um, 
but also um, you know just trying to even uh, uh, the storytelling. However well we can tell the story now, there is a mm. better way. There could be a better way of telling our yeah. you know, statistics, what we're doing, and yeah. how many people have been affected, and and uh, kind of like. Um, uh, bringing everything together like in a closed circle uh, yeah. would potentially help in the long run. But, you know, it's it's a work in progress. For sure. No, I mean, congratulations on, um, you know, getting it to, to where it is now. Uh, oh, what are you. some things, Chris, that you do in your daily rituals, in your daily habits that you found to be most important? Meditate. <laughs> uh, no, but there is, I really don't have like a specific ritual, but um, I try to um, continue, uh, like get it done, get it done. And at the end of the day, you have 24 hours in the day. And when you get to that point where you have to just go to bed, you just do. Um, and, and if there's a huge deadline or something you have to finish up, sometimes you just don't sleep um you know it's not healthy but at the same time it's just you know you gotta be done so. yeah and chris what's you know people out there maybe listening they're trying to overcome something in business or personally what's one thing that they should do right now to get in the mindset to start overcoming one of those challenges um i i think one of those things is yeah, it's just finding your, your, your passion. Uh, we all have passions. Some people don't know what their passions are and they're trying to figure it out. It's okay. Uh, but with the right amount of passion, uh, tenacity and, you know, determination, commitment, you really, really can uh, go a long way. So just wake up and go. It's like those things that you have to just like, take a chance, take a shot, because most of the time there's no that perfect moment where like, oh yeah, and today right, it's ready. Um, you have to get started somewhere. Yeah. And one of the ways you found your passion was just from that personal experience that was painful for you to, that drove you. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And I want you to talk about Chris, just tell people what you're working on now, where they can find and say, thank you, reach out to you and, and some of the sites that uh, you're working on, they can check out. Um, so, um, uh, Sia Bikes is one, uh, and the email for Sia Bikes is admin, A D M I N, at siabikes.org. Uh, you know, if someone send me an email, uh, we'll kind of, we can have a conversation of any questions you have. But um, so, Sia Bikes is one thing I'm working on. The other thing is Prevail, where we build up. Uh, diagnostic devices. It's just like a home pregnancy test, but for HIV AIDS. Um, and my third company is called Heroes. Spell out Prevail. Where can people check it out? Prevail is P R I V A I L. And is it dot com or Prevail DX dot com? DX dot com. So put okay. DX because it's diagnostics. Yeah. Um, and the third company is called Heroes. Uh, Heroes is like a micro. Uh, uh, medical assurance insurance type of company for developing countries because in developing countries yeah, yeah. people don't have medical insurance and even in this country um for the most part and what we do we try to help folks uh crowdfund when they have a huge medical emergency and once they get their they're crowdfunded, they're uh, uh, problem crowdfunded for, um, they pay back the money to the person who crowdfunded, who mm -hmm. lent them the money. And once they pay back, then uh, the person has a chance to take the money out of the system or invest in another person. Uh, but also the person gets a wake up call. They're like, okay, I need insurance. So they can start paying into the system such that when another emergency occurs, they already have some money ready for them to go. And that's heroes, H-Y-R-O-Z.com. Yeah. So my last question for you, Chris, is this, you know, you're, you got a master's, you're getting your PhD, you run a nonprofit, you're starting two for-profits. What do you do? How do you get so much done? Um, it, it's, it's diving in <laughs> and optimism. 
you gotta be really optimistic and uh, you know you wake up every day and want to make a difference in another person's life i'm a product of someone's generosity and i want to pay forward uh, and just when you wake up be glad you're alive and and make a, try to make a difference in another you know person's life but like i said behind closed doors it's tough it's not easy i'm not going to sit here and lie to you that it's an easy thing i just wake up and do it's it's a commitment and uh, determination to, yeah. to make it so what does that look like for you does that mean you're up every you know you're sleeping from 4 to 6 a.m what what do you do to get this much done you got it right i i literally most of the time sleep two hours uh, really and, and i've been lucky that i can abuse that but it's going to get to a point where my body can't take it anymore and uh, i don't have to readjust but until then yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for someone who maybe can't just sleep two hours a day do you do something with your day as far as scheduling goes or how do you you know fit everything in i just kind of have a calendar that um, has three columns and they just put in there what I need to do for these three things. And uh, the fourth one, that's uh, miscellaneous. Um, and just keep at it. Yeah. And so what do you yeah. actually do for fun then? Oh, um, I'm a runner. I love running. Uh, I'm a pilot. I go flying. Mm-hmm. And I love music. So I go dancing. Uh, uh, sometimes at one point I was a... Uh, the DJ with a famous San Francisco club for a minute. Really? It's fun. Uh, yeah, but I, I don't have time anymore to do it. But, uh, you know, I love music and I want to have some time to go out flying and go, you know, enjoy the weather and come back home. Yeah. Chris, I appreciate your time. You are really a true inspiration. Thank, Thank you. you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. I appreciate you so much. Thanks, right. Chris. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the same right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand